the last times we have been speaking about breathing exercises and we emphasized two of them in particular the equal breath and diaphragmatic breathing both of these are very essential to establish diaphragmatic breathing is extremely important and without that it's not a good idea to proceed and establishing an equal breath is a prerequisite it doesn't mean that we cannot do the other practices as yet but it's a foundation it's very important because we need the equal breath also in other practices obviously you don't need equal breath in rechak or two to one breathing but you do need the equal breath in the complete breath when you breathe in out completely and breathe in completely it's an equal breath the inhalation is equal to the exhalation in kapalabhati you don't need it bhastrika more or less since one is active the uh, both sorry both are active exhalation as well as inhalation but they are relatively shallow but more or less the same today we'll continue with ujjayi and brahmadi these are two breathing practices that are actually quite a lot of fun and for both of these we need the equal breath the word ujjayi comes from jaya victory it means victory and perhaps the word comes from the sense the feeling the bhava that this practice creates it creates a sense of contentment a sense of victory a sense of expansion and is an extremely good exercise because it really calms the nerves and the entire body experiences a great deal of vitality so both inhalation and exhalation are equal in this practice both of them inhalation as well as exhalation are slow and deep the unique part about ujjayi is that it takes place with a partially closed glottis it's very difficult to explain or describe now how this is but in a sense we all know it when you sob when you cry it's it's this kind of closure of a part of your you would experience it in your throat and when you inhale you would feel the breath on the top of the roof of the mouth so you would feel the air actually coming to the roof of the mouth and as you inhale you you accompany that with a soft sir sound it's a sibilant sir so i'm going to try to do it a little aloud so that you can experience that sound <sighs> i don't know if you could hear that but it's an inhalation with the focus of your attention at the throat and you would experience the breath at the roof of the mouth when you exhale on the other hand you would make a sound like a her sound and Mm. 
Sorry, Aranka, you seem to be getting some strange noises. Was, was that me trying to do the Ujjayi loud or is there some other... No, there was a complete uh, misforming of your voice, but I locked out and in and now it's okay, so... Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Patricia, Patricia Obermeyer, nice to have you. Um, could you mute yourself, you know, um, I don't know if you know how to do it, You'll, you'd have to figure that out. There's a little green kind of microphone that you need to uh, mute yourself with, if you just click on that Can microphone. Can it doesn't work now? Uh, no? Not yet. I can do it for you. <laughs> <If you. laughs> I can mute you, <laughs> don't, don't think I'm being rude. Uh, the only reason we mute uh, is that sometimes there's background noises. And uh, of course, if you don't have any background noise, it's all right, you can leave it on. If you figure it out, you can mute yourself. You can stop me in between and ask um, if you have any questions, okay? I have a question. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, on a giant breath. Um, should there also be uh, an attempt to um, do the breathing without pause, or is pause okay? Or um, and and also, um, I've always practiced Ujjayi breath with a focus on the complete breath on the Dear Ah, is okay. No, no. Ujjayi, the focus is the sound. Now earlier we said no sounds. Now Ujjayi and Brahmari are two exceptions where, of course, it's not a silent breath, there is a breath, as well as there's a sound, but it's a consciously made. The sound is not an unconscious noise, but it's a special sound. So the focus remains on the sound, and if to, in order to do that, you need to focus on that part of the throat, as I said, you know, the, the glottis. Um, it's an equal breath, it's not a complete breath. Because to do the complete breath, you would have to then focus on diaphragm, clavicular, as well as thoracic, you know, you would have to go shift your attention all the time. And that's not the purpose of Ujjayi. Okay, so could you state one more time for me? What is the purpose of Ujjayi? Ujjayi, the, the emphasis on Ujjayi, in Ujjayi is the sound that you create. Okay. Okay. See, I've always practiced Ujjayi in relation to uh, the asana and uh, Ashtanga Yoga. Mm -hmm. And of course, they only focus on the chest there, with you know, as, as part of practicing asana and, and using Ujjayi, you know, yeah. uh, linking the vinyasa, mm -hmm. you know, one breath with one movement. Yeah. Uh, but I've also practiced it just independent of that and just. You, uh, focusing with uh, using a complete breath, but so in the Himalayan, in the Himalayan tradition, that's not considered correct. It's uh, just no, it's no. basically yes, because the sound of the closing the glottis. Yeah, yes. The reason for this, Scott, is that then you're doing too many things. Um, okay. I, I I don't want to be sounding now like a critic of vinyasa, but it's it's going to end up being that. <laughs> No, I don't Sorry. I don't know exactly how clued in you are to vinyasa, so it might be some people get very offended. So no I hope... sacred cows here. Okay. Good. So um, vinyasa has been created by a Brahmin. As you're aware, <clears throat> it comes from a Brahmin lineage um, of uh, Patabi Joy and in I mean, Tom Krishnamacharya and in turn then Patabi Joy. And um, however much uh, they may claim that they have a lineage and they may claim to have got these practices from a certain source, they have never been able to um, produce that scripture. You know, it's actually been very funny. I forget the name of the book that they claim it's from. But there's no such text existing. And nobody else seems to have heard of this text other than Krishnamacharya, who claims then that it got lost. Here's the Quran or something. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Something, something similar. Uh, I forget the exact name, but I think it's exactly what you said it was. And um, 
so the result is uh, those who sort of know yoga and know the scriptures as well as the traditions, various traditions, they would say, um, well, he mixed a lot of practices with gymnastics that he picked up um, in, in British India. And uh, you may be familiar with the book, um, The Yogic Body, or what was it, The Yoga Body? And uh, it ex is explaining that a little bit more in detail. Uh, these practices... Mark Singleton. Mark Singleton. Yes, exactly, the book by Mark Singleton. Yes. And he, he explains, and it's, it's a very good book, um, a, a historical development of uh, these traditions in modern India, not complete in my opinion, there were many things which were missing, but all the same, uh, quite a good book. And in that we understand that he started mixing things, he took things from different places, a lot of gymnastics in it, a little bit of things from yogic text, and he basically created stuff. A purely yogic tradition would go back far, far back in time let's say at least 6,000 years. <laughs> and it started with yogis living in the jungles and developing practices over a period of time through experimentation on themselves. And one of the important things in our lineages, since it comes from a meditative tradition, an ascetic tradition, is that you don't have too many things that you're doing at the same time. The mind, the attention, is focused on one aspect. So in a ujjayi, which is including complete breath, your mind would have to keep moving from diaphragm to thoracic to clavicular breathing and include sound in it. That's too many things. So... It, um, and of course, then if you include it as part of vinyasa practices, which are physically oriented practices, you can imagine that there are so many things that the mind is continuously shifting from body to breath to sound to body to breath. It's like multitasking. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I, am, I have no issues with multitasking. I can do my work and listen to music and... Uh, uh, you know, and talk to my mother at the same time um, on the phone, uh, it's not possible. The mind shifts uh, very fast from one task to another, all three. It's not on one. It's keeping, keeping on shifting. And that is exactly what happens when you do too many things in a practice which is meant to be primarily a breathing practice and a sound included in it to intensify the breath. The sound, as I already mentioned, with exhalation is ha, like hum. So with inhalation it's sa, with exhalation it's ha. Sounds familiar? So, uh, so, um. so what is that? That's a mantra. That's so hum. That's the sound of the breath. So you intensify what is the natural sound of your breath. You know, you amplify it. And you listen to that sound. Now you're combining two subtle things, the breath and you're adding sound to it, which is even subtler. So you're shifting from slowly from breath, slowly to sound. We give an example in the yogic traditions of a caterpillar. The caterpillar, which is on one leaf, moves very slowly to the next leaf. Does the caterpillar jump? from one leaf to the next leaf? No. The caterpillar, at one point of time, is on both the leaves, right? He's moving from one leaf to the next one. So part of his body is on the first 
leaf and part of his body is on the second leaf, right? So, you see, he's moving from one to the other, but he's not left the first leaf behind entirely. He's already on the second one. And so it is with this. You're taking the breath, is the first leaf, and moving to the next level, which is the second leaf, which is the sound. So we are using both of them to transition subtly and slowly from one to the next. And that's why the focus in Ujjayi is on the sound that is produced at the glottis. And if the focus is on the sound, where would your mind go? Where does your attention go? It automatically and naturally goes, goes to the glottis. And when you're good at it, when you're really good at it, established a certain comfort in it, then you might even forget the, the focus in terms of space of, of, of the glottis itself or being in that space around the throat. But you might start listening, just listening to the sound. And so your attention then moves to the second leaf. You're talking now about going towards sound. Right? So that is why this is a very fine breathing practice and it's preparing us now for pranayam. Remember that pranayam and mantra are very close. They start mixing at some point of time. Which is why pranayam can get us to the same place as mantra can. If you see the document in front of you, you're seeing uh, the preview of my book called Mastering Pranayam. And you, what you're watching is a kind of a building up of Mastering Pranayam, how, how you're moving from the gross to the subtler practices. So you're moving from Practices like Kapalabhati and Bhastrika to subtler practices like Ujjayi and Brahmri, which, including, which include mantra in it. And we are coming now to slowly towards the more, what I call the more exciting parts of Pranayam, the parts that I really uh, love and enjoy, and that's the advanced Pranayam practices, which are at the mental level and not at the physical level. Okay, so uh, anybody else would like to ask about Brahmari? One point that you can uh, note for Bam, Bram, uh, sorry, uh, for Ujjayi is also that during inhalation, the abdominal muscles are kept slightly contracted and during exhalation that pressure is released because even though your focus may be f at the glottis, at the throat, obviously the breathing is still diaphragmatic. That's why we have established diaphragmatic breathing. What's the Mula Bandha? There's no Mula Bandha. No, no. There are no bandhas here. There is no need for bandhas here because the practice is more at, at a uh, very body level, at a very gross level. The bandhas come in much later when you start doing practices at really at the level of prana. Here we are more at the level of breath. So, no, there is no need. Because again, to hold the uh, Mula Bandha, your mind would have to be at, at Mula Bandha, right? Yes. Yes. So how many places can you hold your attention at? You know, Mula Bandha, diaphragm, uh, chest, <laughs> glottis, uh, sound. Do you, do you see already you have four or five things? It's already a kind of an overload on the brain. <laughs> you know, too many things to, to watch out for. Yes, thank you for that explanation. It's very, very, very helpful. Yes. This is one of the things in our modern life, you know, we are continuously, our minds are going to many, many different things. So 
I am, I'm hoping that everybody is listening to me when, when I speak in the online meetings, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of you are perhaps at the same time on Facebook or checking your emails or, uh, you know, maybe typing something or looking at your mob mobiles or, or I don't know, you know what I mean. Oh, yes, Shibu confesses, yes. So that's because our minds in our modern life have been almost trained, <laughs> trained to do so many different things. And in the yogic process, we are learning to drop the many and come to that one point, to keep the focus. Yes, Aranga, keeping focus. Remember the um, story of the third eye, you know, Shiva. Is, he has this power in the third eye when he's really very upset, you know. His third eye opens and there is this beam, laser beam, which comes out and can burn anything to ashes. What is that beam? It's like a laser beam. And what is a laser beam? Laser beam is concentrated energy. And that's what you want to do. You want to concentrate your energy. You don't want your energy to be dissipated. If your mind is on many different objects, what you say at the same time, it's never at the same time, because the mind will be rapidly shifting from one thing to another. And when you are rapidly shifting from one thing to another, what you have is a divided and scattered mind. And that's what our society is promoting. Our modern lifestyle is promoting a divided and scattered mind. And so our job is not to, to only try to um, be focused during meditation, but also try to organize one's life so that you're not doing too many things all the time, too many different things. Try as far as possible to be with one thing at a time. You will see it will make a difference in your life for the positive. Yeah, Gautam, it's a pity you're considered slow if you don't multitask. But um, I have been experimenting a lot with different things myself. And um, for example, when I am on online meetings, I'm only concentrated on the online meetings. I'm not looking at my mobile or or, uh, you know, on Facebook. So I would not be able to have these online meetings if I would be simultaneously on Facebook as well as fiddling with my mobile and um, maybe listening to music <laughs> with my earphones. So you see, to achieve something, you need a focused mind. You need to be focused. I'm sure a lot of you may have experienced that you, you're spending so much time doing so many different activities and then at the end of the day you're totally exhausted and you ask yourself, hey, what did I achieve? And you say, hey, I didn't do anything really worth talking about. You know, I'm sure that some of you have had that feeling. And that's because you're feeling exhausted because of the scattered mind. It's a dissipated mind. And that's what we need to learn with all practices. Find out what is the focal point of that practice and do just that. Okay, focus on that. So in Ujjayi, it is in terms of space, allowing your attention to be at the glottis, at the sort of at the top of the throat. And with time, as you become more proficient in the practice, you will experience yourself, experience yourself just being with the sound. So, uh, okay. Um, Abba, my, your microphone is giving problems. You can listen, right? Yeah, that's fine. What are the benefits? Well, Lots of benefits. I mean, the basic thing is that in these sessions, we are not focusing on benefits 
as in uh, is it good for for the for my for respiratory disorders or also all the practices are good for um, vitality increasing vitality what we are trying to do in the sessions of mastering pranayam since i think you, this is the first time you're here is a preparation for higher states of meditation and it's suitable for those who want to attain uh, higher states of meditation ultimately leading to um, the union of uh, individual self with the um, cosmic self so those who have um, the desire to attain the highest they should uh, think in terms not in terms of benefits as in is it good for my cough and cold but is this leading to um holistic health at all levels physical pranic mental social as well and ultimately spiritual health one who is uh, established in that health is um will will heal himself even at a physical level so i will therefore in the entire sessions i don't mention any particular benefits you know like some people do i just say that it's it's going to increase vitality and calm the mind as well that's an automatic result of doing a practice like um ujjayi because the breath is equal inhalation and exhalation is equal and because of the sound which is very calming all right the next practice is brahmari brahmari comes from the word sanskrit word b brahmari is a b and as we all know bees make a, a wonderful delicious um, besides making honey they make a wonderful sound a humming sound which sounds like mm. i just did it louder and more exaggerated but that's the humming sound did that sound familiar to you does it sound like a mantra sounds like oh yes and that's what it is once again just like ujjayi it is the same caterpillar principle of moving from one leaf to the next we are moving from breath to the sound and here in this similar with the equal breathing you inhale normal breath and exhale producing a humming sound and you can do this for a couple of minutes it also is very soothing for the nerves and calms the mind and the main purpose as i mentioned is the sound initially your you may be more with the breath and the sound which is vibrating more or less in your head in terms of space but eventually you might just forget your breath and you can just listen to the sound it goes mm and that's oh Can you close the glass for this also? No, this is just it's like a it's like a humming sound when you breathe out you breathe out and go mm you will feel the vibration a little bit on your lips. And for that you don't need to close the glottis because if you do that you will make a different sound. It's going to be slightly different. And then your attention will go go to the glottis. Here you're just more with the sound itself. You're shifting now entirely to the second leaf you know you've gone from you're moving towards the subtler sounds so 
So we have done quite a few breathing um, exercises. We have done equal breath, we have done two to one breath, we have done the complete breath, Kapalabhati, Basrika, Ujjayi and Brahmari. So what is the order of practice? Well, if you have mastered diaphragmatic breathing and equal breathing, th these definitely come at number one and number two. These two come on top. With the other practices, there is no rigid order. What we generally do recommend is the order which is given here on the page, which is then two to one, complete breath, Kapalabhati, Astrika, Ujjayi and Brahmvi. But depending on the stage of your practice, you can change it. I have mentioned it in the website very often. The last couple of sessions, we looked at Kapalabhati and Brahmvi and we used the articles from the website for that. And right on top of all, each article, I always say, uh, this is for those who are uh, part of the mentoring program. And so always do these in consultation with uh, a guide who is an experienced guide. So if you don't have a guide, you can have this order and stick to it. A change in order of practice is only necessary at much, much uh, higher levels of practice when you are really coming to a direct experience of prana itself. Just in terms of, you know, my own experience, um, that can take years. Okay. So I just it's... wanted to ask about. Um, you said that uh, you know the all the breathing exercises they help to calm down the mind. Mm. Um, now there are some of them, Kapalabhati or Astrika. Mm. They are quite rigorous, so it maybe it sounds a little paradoxical that they help to calm down the mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, um, they do. They are cleansing practices like Kapalabhati for example, is definitely a, a cleansing practice. It is one of the Shatkriyas and it is used here in that sense. We are using all the breathing practices first as cleansing practices, removal of toxins. Ujjayi also, for example, it brings tremendous vitality and one of the reasons that is there is a lot of exhalation. It removes a lot of toxins. A lot of carbon dioxide is removed from the lungs a lot of oxygen enters the body, oxygenates the lung, oxygenates the brain, and this itself produces a lot of vitality. The removal of toxins cleansing process is also extremely relaxing. And that's why the process is, the entire process of all the breathing exercises is calming. So it may sound paradoxical because Bastrika, for example, sounds very... Um, you know, like it's churning up a lot of, and it does churn up a lot of fire. But that energy is not comparable to attention or aggression. That has a different quality. That energy that we churn up is far more, you know, sattvic in nature and not rajasic in nature. So all the practices that we do here are cleansing. They are relaxing, they oxygenate, they energize, they give us much more fire in the body and calm the nervous system as well, uh, relax the muscles also, if done correctly. They uh, are the basis for meditation which is still to come, of course. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting because I've seen, you know, some yoga um, schedules where they start in this asana and then they go into a relaxation and that they are, they try to avoid them doing these breathing exercises after the relaxation, which is not only the end of the class, mm. because they say, well, then we disturb our students because... Um, 
we wake them up, so to say, again, and <laughs> all of their relaxed state. So it's interesting when you see also the breathing exercises in the whole sequence of the uh, practice that you do. Mm. Yeah, but when they are doing relaxation, they're probably doing sh uh, Shavasana, right? Yes. And yes, uh, yes and in that case, I would say the Shavasana they're doing, that in our tradition is a simplified version of 61 points. And 61 points is not what most people understand as relaxation. For most people, relaxation means sort of lying around doing nothing. But relaxation is defined as release of toxins from the body and mind. It says so here, and it's not my definition, but it's, it's the oral tradition. Relaxation is the release of toxins from body and mind. And practices like 61 points energize the body and go very, very deep. They're at a completely different level. They're not at the body level. The people that you're talking about, they're doing relaxation at a muscular level, which is at the level of the body. And when we are doing relaxation, we're yeah. talking about relaxation at a far deeper level of prana or at the mental level. That's the third kosha. For those of you who may be familiar with it, you know that there is the there are five koshas, five layers of the body. The first is the physical layer. So you have the muscular layer. And a lot of people do asanas <clears throat> for that. Then there's a pranic layer and we do breathing exercises and some advanced pranayam practices to help us go deeper to the mind, to prepare for meditation and to come in touch with our buddhi, our inner wisdom, which is the fourth layer of uh, discriminative intelligence or the Jnanamaya Kosha and then the fifth layer Anandamaya Kosha or pure joy, bliss. So if you're relaxing just at a muscular level you are at the first Kosha but when we are talking about relaxation we are talking about being at the second or even the third Kosha, yeah. right? Yeah. So of course it there, the construction of these practices, the, the, the order of these practices should always go from body to, to, to pranic vehicle to the manamaya kosha to, you know, to go steadily inwards. Okay, so I hope that made some sense. That. Yes. Yeah. So we're coming now to the, some of my favorite parts. Uh, oh yeah, Shibu, when you have a cold, can we do Basrika and Kapalabhati? In general, when you have acute issues, coughs, colds, nasal, some sort of infections, sinus infections, chronic in uh, sorry, acute. In acute situations, you should not do heavy pranayam. You can do something light. You can do breathing practices like diaphragmatic breathing. If your nose is not blocked, you can do equal breathing. Because if your nose is blocked, you're going to have a hard time in any case doing any of these breathing practices. You could do Kapalabhati if it helps release some of the phlegm, some of the mucus. Because as you know, Kapalabhati is a cleansing exercise. But you cannot even do Jalneti when you have an acute infection or acute problem. So you should avoid uh, Jalneti and Reduce your breathing practices to, to very gentle diaphragmatic breathing during the time of acute problems. If you have chronic respiratory problems, depending on what you have, it's best you seek guidance. 
those, for example, who have severe asthma would start practicing um, Bhastrika can set off an asthmatic attack. Those who have chronic problems related to the lungs, such as bronchitis, um, can damage their lungs because their lungs are already, you know, are not healthy. And then the vigorousness of that practice could, could harm the finer tissues in the lungs. So if you have chronic problem, <clears throat> you should do these practices only under guidance. The only practice which is safe to do at all times is diaphragmatic breathing. And equal breathing, if it is done gently, only up to about eight counts. So, um, shall we continue? If there are no more questions. So, we're going to uh, do one of the finest uh, yogic practices, and that's Nadi Shodhana. you can see it. So as I have shown here, always on top of the article, I always say it's for those participating in yoga mentoring. And this is, in a sense, um, I'm doing that so that uh, people do not um, misunderstand and harm themselves in doing any of these practices. If there is any doubts, you can always um, write me or ask me during these online meetings. So for Nadi Shodhanam, Nadis are channels, the energy channels in the body. Shodhanam comes from Shuddh, which means to purify. So Nadi Shodhanam is a very fine purifying practice, purifying the energy channels. So once you have established natural diaphragmatic breathing, equal breath, you're silent, you're smooth, you have eliminated extended pauses, then you're ready to start Nadi Shodhanam. So Nadi Shodhanam is one of the slightly more, say, complicated practices, requires a little bit more concentration. So you need to pay attention when you're doing this. You can sit in the usual meditative postures. And we have two ways of doing it, basically. One is with fingers, which we use Vishnu Mudra, and the other one is without. In this session, we are only going to do the one with fingers using Vishnu Mudra. The reason is that we first need to really... Um, be very familiar with the practice before we move on to the next step. At the first level, we use the fingers here, the hand and the fingers, and this is mudra, the Vishnu Mudra. You bend two of the fingers there, the index finger and the middle finger. And that's how you use the thumb to close one nostril and then use the other to, to close the other nostril. So this is known as Vishnu Mudra. When you use the Vishnu Mudra, you don't need to use any pressure. You know, you don't need to really close your nostril fully. Just a gentle touch and is enough. You don't have to really press it down. So once again, you should know that we start with the base always of whether it's two seconds, three seconds. <coughs> but first you need to learn the order of practice. 
So you should first find out which is your active nostril and which is the passive nostril. That's the first thing you need to do. Before you start this practice, you just have to put your finger below your nostrils. Test which nostril is active. If you study the breath, you will notice this, that always one nostril is active and the other is passive. Almost all the time, we are breathing only from one nostril. And there's a cycle. We're shifting from left to right and right to left. And this cycle is about 90 minutes. It shifts in about 1 hour to 90 minutes. No? 60 minutes to 90 minutes, it shifts. So you need to see, when you start your practice, where am I breathing from? From which nostril? So whichever your active nostril may be, you start with the active nostril. Now this is the first variation. If you're actively breathing from one nostril, from that nostril you breathe out. You breathe in from the passive. You breathe out from the active. You breathe in from the passive. Now you change, no sorry, you breathe out from the active and breathe in from the passive and then you change. You breathe out from the passive, you breathe in from the active. Breathe out from the passive, in from the active. Out from the passive, in from the active. And that is one cycle. So the duration of the inhalation and exhalation should be equal. You do not need to count. If you want to count, you may do so. But you will find that it's going to be very difficult to, to continue to count because there are already so many things that you need to focus on. You need to keep shifting your nostrils. You need to remember you know, which is active, which is passive. So this requires quite a high degree of attention. And if you're going to include counting in it, you might be a little bit overwhelmed by all the things that you need to do. And that's why this practice comes towards the end. You remember we already talked about breathing without counts. And so by now, you should have got a feel for an equal breath. You should have just by feel, you know that your inhalation is equal to your exhalation. And then if you do know that, you can focus purely on shifting. Shifting from one nostril to the other. After you do one cycle, you can rest a little bit. Do the next set. Rest for a few seconds maybe 15 seconds, maybe 10, you know, 20 seconds, do the next set. You generally do three sets. Okay. Then there's variation two. You need to know, as usual, your active nostril. You breathe out and you breathe in. Then you go to your passive nostril. You breathe out, you breathe in. Active nostril, breathe out, breathe in. Passive, breathe out, breathe in. Active, breathe out, breathe in. Passive, breathe out, breathe in. So here you always start with the exhalation. In each of the nostrils you always start with exhalation. The same rules apply. The inhalation and exhalation should be equal as far as possible. You don't need to count. You need to focus now on paying attention. Remember the caterpillar principle. Now you're moving from breath to mind. So you need to start paying attention. You're focusing your energies on the nostril, active as well as passive. You're moving from one to the other. And variation three, 
active nostril and you go exhalation, inhalation, exhalation, inhalation, exhalation, inhalation. And then you go to the passive and do the same. And that's one set. You do three sets. Have you noticed something interesting about these three variations? Does anybody notice anything really interesting about this? How you're moving from one nostril to the other here. You see the movement from one nostril to the other in the first variation is much more than the movement from one nostril to the other in the second variation. You can see that movement here. Here you see you spend a little longer time with one nostril, then you spend a little longer time here as well. Here you have one breath here and one breath here, one breath here and one breath here. And here there are two, inhalation as well as exhalation, inhalation, exhalation. So you're spending a little more time with this nostril here and then with the passive nostril. And here, you see there's even less movement. Now you're with the active nostril for one, two, three breaths. And here you are with the passive nostril for three breaths again. What does that tell you? One, it might take longer to balance the breath with one than with the latter than with the former. Um, not quite. We we are doing all three variations every time. Remember that. And the purpose of this practice is not so much the breath itself, but the mind. And you're shifting, yes, Patricia, you're putting more focus on the nostrils. You're going from one to the other. You're shifting nostrils here, and that's where it is explained here, that your nostril attention should be here when you're breathing in. And then it should be at the other one. So in the first exercise, you shifted from one to the other, and one to the other, and one to the other. You kept shifting from one from left to right, from left to right. In the second one, you spent a little longer here, and then a little longer here. A little longer here, and a little longer here. The third variation, you spent three, you know, three breaths there, and however, depending on the length of your breaths, you're spending a much longer time here, and then a much longer time here. If I take just four, um, our purposes as an example, just two breaths in and out, then taking the first variation, I'll be here for two seconds, then two seconds, then two seconds, then two seconds. In the variation two, I would be here for two breaths in and out. That would be four seconds, four seconds, four seconds, four seconds. If I take the third version, then I'll be here for six seconds, six seconds, six seconds, and six seconds. So you're spending longer time at a certain focal point. Okay. So does that give you an opportunity to, to introspect on the lunar or solar uh, qualities of the mind then? Mm, that's where we are getting to. But I wouldn't say that we are introspecting. That implies already that the mind is somehow working that you're thinking. It's not a thinking process, it's an observation process. You're just allowing your attention to be at that spot and observe the breath. And when you do that, when you observe the breath, it's getting active. That particular nostril gets active. When you put it here, even though this nostril may be inactive, just by putting your focus here, your focus of attention here, it starts getting active. At the same time, you're learning to teach your mind, you're teaching your mind one-pointedness. Remember, you're moving from the gross to the subtle. 
So if you did asanas, then you did all, all the breathing practices that we talked about. We are moving to remembering the caterpillar principle to the next subtler level. Now we are with very, very subtle breath entering the domain of the mind. We're not quite there with the mind yet, but we are learning to shift our attention. We are learning one-pointedness. At a technical level, not at a mental level yet, at just at a technical level, we are learning to drop all the different, different focal points and just stay here at this one point. And in doing so, you are also activating the nostrils. And when you activate the breath in the nostril, remember what we said right in the beginning. Breath is the, one of the only aspects of the body which is voluntary as well as involuntary. So it is through the breath that we use it as a handle to influence our mind and our nervous system. By doing this practice, we are calming down the nervous system. That's what Nadi Shodhanam means. Purifying the Nadis means balancing both the energies, Ida and Pingala, solar and lunar, male, female. We're bringing them into balance. Right brain, left brain. Sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system. These are all the dualities. And we are learning through this practice to calm them down, to slowly balance them. But it's important that you do not do this. A lot of people A lot of people, when they do this visualization, uh, when they do this practice, they start visualizing the breath traveling through this nostril in breath traveling out. It's not a visualization practice. So do not visualize the breath flow. It's not a visualization technique. You're learning to use the mental effort, focusing awareness on the space before the nostrils. This is a critical aspect of the training. If you do not train this, you cannot move ahead. There are a lot of people who keep talking about one-pointed mind and one-pointedness. They use a technical definition, which is from the Yoga Sutras, and they say one-pointedness or one-pointed mind is Focusing on one thing, you know, and only on that thing continuously. So only one thought is in the mind. So if you have a focal point of breath, you're only with the breath all the time. Most people are not able to sustain that. And the reason is that most of the times during the day, you had spent your time looking at your mobile, writing on Facebook, doing your work and listening to music all at the same time. You had not learned to let go or drop one by one, drop the distractions. One by one, come to one point. And that is exactly the process here, from gross to subtle, moving from the many to the one, moving from the gross to the subtle. Okay? And that's why this is very important here. Not to be skipped, not to be taken lightly. Okay, there are some comments in the chat box. So let me see. Um, I missed quite a few. <laughs> okay, Shibu, how do, if we do not count, how do we know it's equal? That's what I said. That that's what you do right in the beginning. By the time you come to Nadi Shodhanam, you should have developed a feel of what is an equal breath. You should just have a feel that your breath is more or less equal. If you don't have that feeling, if you don't have the confidence that to be able to do that, then don't. Then just stay there in the earlier pranayams where you can count. 
Only when you have st started leaving the counting behind, then you should do this. Because to do Nadi Shodhanam with counting takes away the, the you know, the, the, the core of this practice is shifting the attention and not the counting. All right, so um, there's Nita, Aranka, beginning of concentration, going to meditation. Yes, it's uh, the process of getting subtle. That's right. Patricia, if we do three rounds of Nadi Shodham in this sequence, do we always start with the active nostril? What about combining three variations in nine rounds? Hmm. What about combining three variations in nine rounds? I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, you want to do... Um, I mean, normally you take one variation and then you do three rounds of it. Then you move on to this and do three rounds. Because if you're here and you're doing, you're shifting rapidly from one nostril to the other. In the second variation, you're not shifting so rapidly. So you have calmed down, you have slowed down the movement of your mind. So what you're, where we are getting at is slowing down the movement of the mind, yeah? You're getting the point? The idea is to slow down the movement of the mind. And then in the next variation, you do another three rounds. And here, you have slowed down again the movement of the mind because you're with this nostril for so much longer. You're, that's how you're learning one point at mind. You know? That's how you're learning to pay attention at one spot. All right? Is this also, is this the best method, you think, for getting to the point where you can change the flow simply by your consciousness, as Shomirama talks about? Yes, this is, as far as I know, the only method. I don't know any other method. There are other methods which are very, very gross methods. We will come to them when we uh, do Nadi Shodnam without Vishnu Mudra, without hands. And at that point of time, we will discuss the other methods for changing flow of nostrils. You know, it's like lying on one side and, you know, lying on the other side. <laughs> Many, some other methods which are mm, definitely not something I would recommend for any serious uh, seeker. So this is the finest. Then, were there anything else? Aranka, can we do two to one breathing during Nadi Shodnam? Why? Why do you want to do that? You're going to bring in more, more elements in there. I know that there are traditions that combine many practices. They do kumbhak, you know, in uh, breath retention, etc. with this. You take away from the main purpose. And the main purpose is the shifting of the breath mastering the process of shifting your attention, mastering the process of focusing on one spot, mastering Ida and Pingala, the dualities, purifying the, uh, the, the uh, channels. You know, less is more. So the less activity we have, the less we have, it's already even the way it is currently, it is not um, easy to master the way it is, even the way it is currently. And this is the simplest version. And if you do it with the understanding that the reason we are doing this is to focus the mind, purify the channels, balance the nervous system. Matthew, um, uh, Matthias, uh, Om Kriya is another practice. We will do that next session. This is not Om Kriya. This is Nadi Shodnam and the focus here is at the nostrils, not at Sushumna or at the energy channel, Centrinus Canalis. That practice we will probably do next time if we... If we 
get there that far. Okay, so this is Nadi Shodnam, three versions, and now I think you understand the importance of learning to shift your attention and why that moves on to the more subtler level of the mind. Okay. Good, we are already five minutes over time. And um, I think that was a fun session. I enjoyed myself explaining this because now, as I told you, we are getting to the parts I really enjoy. So you will hear that in my voice. And I hope you all have a, a nice um, whatever is left of your weekend. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, Radhika. Welcome. Thank you, Radhika. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Radhika. <laughs> Thank you, Radhika. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. B